While the topic of this video isn't technically a horror movie, it might as well be because honestly, I find 2019 to be kind of meh for horror movies, or at least ones that left me genuinely shaken. Hell, Marriage Story and Uncut Gems were more horrifying than most of the things I watched. Sure, I did love Midsummer, but I can't deny I didn't have expectations for how it was going to play out, and for those asking, what about The Lighthouse, the one key horror movie of 2019 I've yet to ever mention? I mean, yeah, it came somewhat close at times, but that film is so abstract to a certain degree that I wouldn't say it made me fear anything as much as I liked it for, uh, appreciative reasons, shall we say. I know it seems like I'm setting the bar very high for myself, but after a while there's a difference between appreciating the merits of something and feeling emotionally impacted by it. So with that in mind, I'm going to introduce you to a period drama that got under my skin more than any other film in 2019 that was clearly trying to get under my skin. But you could say I'm somewhat cheating by picking a film that's about 1800s British colonialism. So let's talk about it. Take the atmosphere of The Witch and put it alongside the tone of The Revenant and then sprinkle the Babadook in between, you basically get The Nightingale, the second feature film by Babadook writer and director Jennifer Kent. Wait Ryan, the Babadook you say? Well, surely you'd think after such an influential cult follow debut there would be a bit more attention around her sophomore follow up. And sure, while it features many of the eerie silent era horror elements that the Babadook is best known for, The Nightingale is a very different and deep deeply distressing beast to watch. We're all all right! <laughs> now, I'm obviously not going to show anything that the YouTube police will bite my balls off for, but I am still going to give you a verbal content warning because during its run at the Sydney Film Festival, there were accounts of people walking out because of its very explicit depiction of rape and murder, as if people weren't expecting it from a film about 19th century colonialism. The film is set in 1825 on the British penal colony of Van Diemen's Land, before it became the colony of Tasmania in 1854, eventually being partially liberated as part of the Commonwealth of Australia in 1901. And with that, you get a pretty fair idea as to the kind of film this is. It's a morbid, grossly uncompromising portrait of the British Empire's supreme reign over a country that was basically used to exile prisoners from the civil population, during which the Empire tried to forcibly remove the Aboriginal people from their land entirely. The story, in a nutshell, follows an Irish convict called Claire who is savagely beaten and raped multiple times on screen and helplessly watches as her husband and baby get murdered by several British soldiers all within the first 20 fucking minutes before setting off on a journey to get revenge on said soldiers. And from there, we're clearly in for something a bit, uh, touchy. I will be going into major spoilers later in the video, so I will give you a fair warning when we get to that, but for now I'm going to try and sell you on the type of haunting experience this is, because while on the outset it looks like a very straightforward revenge tale, it actually goes in a lot of interesting directions that subvert a lot of the typical genre tropes when it comes to these revenge is sweet style narratives. For context, the film did receive a lot of acclaim at the AACTA Awards, which is Australia's version of the Oscars, winning Best Picture, Screenplay, Director, Actress and Supporting Actress, and just on a side note, the guy who plays Charles Manson in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood and Mindhunter got a Best Supporting Actor nod as well, so I wouldn't be surprised if he's found a niche for himself playing diabolical monsters. I bring this up specifically because I guess you could say this film somewhat thematically complements my video on Once Upon a Time by exploring the nasty depiction of violence that Tarantino's film also explores with its more glamorized fictional violence, especially in the context of how Tarantino's filmography represents the sensational aspects of revenge cinema. You can go watch my video on that to get the full context. Anyway. 
for the sensitive types who poke at anything remotely triggering, the film is by no means tasteless because despite what is shown, Jennifer Kent very cleverly leaves a significant chunk of the historical actualities and atrocities out of the frame and instead relies on atmosphere and character to infer and insinuate to the kind of cruel world that Tasmania has become, establishing it as a sort of introspective mood piece where the horror is left largely to your imagination. Hell, Claire herself isn't exactly a heart of gold either because she's also a racist who conflicts with her guide Billy until she eventually becomes more compassionate towards him as she realizes that he has lost way more than she could ever imagine, reinforcing a bond between them where they find strength and comfort amongst all the pain and misery. For as bleak as it's presented, the film is about finding togetherness in loss. We follow two oppressed characters who each have tragically lost all meaning to them, and their quest becomes defined by unleashing only the anger left within them, even though that ultimately won't change anything. The film begins with Claire working to obtain her freedom from the vile Lieutenant Hawkins, only for him to persistently deny it, which leads to Claire's husband trying to kindly plea with him to Claire's request. Ultimately, her husband resorts to anger and thus violence because of the injustice, resulting in Hawkins and his band of vicious pirates, I mean soldiers, seeking retribution by killing Claire's family, effectively leaving the film as a back and forth cat and mouse chase, where Claire becomes this complete embodiment of pure, relentless rage that gradually withers away as the film goes along. In between this, there are these creepy dream sequences that turn the film into a partial psychological horror where she's not only tormented by the soldiers who ruined her life, but also her dead family. This is where those Babadook elements manifest. The film is very gothic in its approach by using a lot of silent cinema techniques and the maison-scene to reinforce this cold, sinister wilderness where all peace and harmony have been sucked out of it. I'm sure by now, given this is the internet, I have dozens of politically triggered comments already, but the film doesn't really present itself in a political tone, even if it is. For all its extremities, it's very delicately handled. The horror is all alluded to with a raw, visceral presentation that doesn't beat you around the head with its themes. There's not even a soundtrack to force any illusion of dramatic tension or emotion. Everything is carried by the pure ambience of the forest, and the agonizing screaming and crying of victims being pillaged and murdered in the background. Hell, it's more of an apocalypse movie than most apocalypse movies. The screams even become this grisly motif where Claire tries so hard to repress the repetitive cries of her now dead baby, while conversely the lieutenant's way of drowning out a similar noise is to well literally shoot the problem as he's been trained to do, which only perpetuates the problem like how Claire's suffering is bottled up without any release. The film is driven solely by emotion over intellect. In fact, there's not even a single thoughtful decision made by any character in the story. Everything is driven back to the same barbaric idea, which is to fight fire with fire. It solves a problem, but only temporarily, until that very pain you're trying to relieve comes back to haunt you and things just get much, much worse. Now, from here, I'm going to spoil the rest of the film, so consider this your final warning before we go into major spoilers. So, if you want to go off and watch some good old-fashioned misery porn, now's your chance to leave the video. And for those that just want to stick around for the soothing sounds of my voice, let's talk about its unique portrayal of a revenge tale. As I said earlier, this is a film where the motive gradually withers out as opposed to the usual crescendo style climax where we escalate to that pure cathartic release that's common to revenge films. The thing is, in The Nightingale, we never get that release. When Claire kills the first soldier responsible for killing her baby, she's left shaken and terrified by it. It actually weakens her because all this immediate rage that bubbled up to this very point leaves her with a moment of reflection where her grief finally consumes her. It's a very reactionary story, one that is organically defined by the emotional disposition of Claire, not an intellectual one. It follows the first tick of her hit list with nothing but more suffering. It's not like John Wick where he got that cathartic release for finally getting the guy that killed his dog. She got 
a release, but it was not the one she was expecting because it hasn't suddenly made things all better. Her anger becomes symbolized by that of her husband, who tried to rationally obtain her freedom, but he succumbed to his anger, leading to the events we see before us. There's that fear that she will inevitably follow in the same fate as her family. His appearances in her dreams are meant to ease her, but they do the opposite because she's juggling it with the same rage and fear she has for the soldiers, to the point that she's practically having a psychotic breakdown. He's there to tell her that it's okay to let go because her family are in a better place, and nothing good can come from revenge, as it is technically a meaningless act in the grand scheme of things. When she does eventually come to that cinematic crescendo style climax similar to True Grit, she ultimately freezes, gets shot and bollocks off into the forest, leaving Billy behind. There's something so unfortunately real about it. Bravery can so easily be suppressed by allowing awareness for your vulnerability to take its place. Claire becomes less and less determined as she goes along, the complete opposite of what cinema has shown us. Violent retribution has proven not to bring peace, and so she gradually begins to let go of her rage. It's not to say her motive becomes pointless by the end, it's that she realizes that revenge won't bring her the catharsis she desires, nor will it stop all the atrocities already happening. At the end of the day, she's just one victim of millions, which following her reunion with Billy after he escapes the soldiers, is reflected when the perspective seemingly switches to him, where he learns that his people are all dead, turning his resigned depressed acceptance into determination to seek his own form of revenge. When they arrive in town, Claire confronts Lieutenant Hawkins one final time and, instead of killing him like we expect, she simply but more profoundly shows strength through song symbolizing that culture will never die and will be talked about in the history books while he himself will never have the legacy he so desperately wanted. Hawkins' character is driven by this one soulless desire to obtain a promotion, which he goes to such great lengths to get by practically throwing all his closest allies and friends under the bus to get to. He manipulates them, plays their bravery and masculinity against one another, even going as far as to switch the ranks of his closest subordinate with a child, only to shoot that child when they cower when pressured to kill Billy. His motive is just as meaningless. He's a vessel for humanity's ugliness. He can do what he wants and get away with it, and then when our perspective switches to Billy, he seeks revenge as a statement towards this. Billy is the one that kills the final soldiers instead of Claire, reflecting on the idea that humanity will always be a culture of violence when peace is at stake. Watching the sunrise with our two protagonists should be a relief, and I guess to some extent it is, even if nothing was truly gained from anyone's actions. But it does at least give Claire a newfound perspective on life, one where her pain and suffering is universal to everyone, and during the these darkest times, her brief moment of peace was found in the comfort of knowing she was never alone.